you discover through the course of the film that he is a he, you know he suppressed his noble inclinations mm. but they can't stay suppressed forever right and a lot of it suppressed through the suffering of a heartbreak mm. which you know he gets reminded of that heartbreak when the love of his life shows up unexpectedly Chris, thanks for being on the show. Luke, it's a pleasure to be here. Oh, this is super fun. <laughs> I know because you've got the wonderful show Philosophers on YouTube. And even before YouTube, you had it on the KRUU station. Was that right? Yeah. Somehow I got it in my mind to uh, do a movie movie chat, movie talk show. Um, started 20 years ago or so at uh, KMCD, actually. Really? Its first incarnation was called The Flick Pickers. <laughs> <laughs> and like and then, not everyone liked that. And <laughs> we, I, I came up with the Filmosophers. Filmosophers shortly after that. And did the show for years with Jimmy Moore and the KRUU crew. Yep. Uh, host our show live 1230 on Fridays, every Friday weekly, with my wonderful co-host Bruce Miller, who many people know from here in town. And uh, Bruce and I just, we had a wonderful time for, for a long time doing that show. And wherever I was in the world, uh, 1230 Central, I would, if I was in town, great. But if not, I would call in yeah. and uh, I made a ball. That's fantastic. I do miss the crew radio station. It was so fun to tune in. And I think I heard your show on several occasions at least. We had a good following. Yeah. But people love movies. They want to hear what's coming out, what's good, maybe get some tips, recommendations. Um. You know, being here in Iowa, we couldn't always see what <laughs> what was coming in the latest films, and we weren't in a position to get screeners from the, you know, from the um, uh, the distribution companies. So we relied a lot on Rotten Tomatoes and, and online reviews. So we would talk about movies we hadn't seen yet, but we would talk about what other people were saying about the movies, and it worked okay. People liked it. We talk about the new releases. We talk about favorite films, and and I'm hoping we can do some of that. Oh, absolutely, we will. Time. But you you've had some very notable guests on your show, um, I, and I'm just picking several out of the hat here. But like David Lynch, and who else? You, well, John Hagelin was another popular. We had episode. we had John Hagelin on as a guest not too long ago. John is a movie fan, and uh, I thought it'd be fun to do a segment, kind of in the area of um because he's a physicist, astrophysicist, and quantum physicist, I thought it would be fun to do a show on uh, science fact versus science fiction. And we selected a couple of uh, space movies, space films, uh, Gravity, The Martian, Interstellar. And he did a little deep dive into those to kind of say what was fact from fiction in those films. And that was fun. Uh, we had uh, Michael Imperioli, who um, was uh, Christopher on The Sopranos, Joe Manganiello, from um, True Blood and Magic Mike, uh, Thomas Jane, um, Boogie Nights. He's been, he's been a lot of films, a lot of TV, and The Expanse most recently, I think. Here's the, the, the challenges because it's fairly new and we don't have a big audience um, yet. We're building our audience, but to get really top names, they want to know, publicists want to know how big is your audience, you know, it's, it's going to be worth my client's time. So for a lot of the people that it's been kind of um, either, you know, personal uh, relationship or just happenstance, like um, Michael Imperioli's publicist knew that Michael is a really dedicated Buddhist practitioner and he loves talking about his Buddhist practice. And because we, I told her that we were, um, uh, my co-host and I are longtime meditation teachers, she thought, oh, he might be into that. And so he came on and loved it. We had a ball. That's so, so cool. Anyway, so it's kind of conversations, mostly conversations with people from behind or in front of the camera, uh, talking about movies, but also it's the philosophers. So we will delve into if, if our guest has a, um, you know, maybe a spiritual practice or the meditation or, or faith based or martial arts or Buddhism or something where, and, and where she can talk about that, talk about their philanthropy. And part of the format is we talk to them about their favorite films, mm. which is fun. <laughs> we have them send us a list ahead of time. 
what are their favorite films? So we get, and, and that's exciting for people to talk about their favorite movies. Absolutely. So um, it's great. And my co-host is a, a gentleman named Dean Slider. Mm. And Dean is a, a lifelong friend. And by lifelong, we knew each other when we were each in the womb, actually. Our parents were friends in a little village in Long Island. And so, and he would babysit me, you know. And then, you know, the families were close, but years later, he became a TM teacher, that meditation teacher, as did I, independent of one another. We didn't know. But he's also a movie buff. And a couple of years ago, he wrote a book called Cinema Nirvana, Enlightenment Lessons from the Movies, in which he looks at movies and kind of plums them for kind of the, the Dharma. He's got a Buddhist now, kind of a Buddhist sensibility. So he looks at kind of the Dharma lessons from movies. But it's not movies like The Matrix or, you know, so-called spiritual films. It's movies like The Godfather and The Graduate and mm-hmm. Jaws. And and he he just dives deeply in them to draw out Things that the, the, the director, the writer, the creator may have had no, no idea, no sense, you know, when they made the film, but which, which reveal interesting spiritual dimension. Anyway, so that's a little bit about the philosophy. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, well, so I was curious, I mean, so are, are you quite literally calling some of these publicists and just being like, hey, we got this show and yeah. really straight yeah. up yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's working. Yeah, I got my IMDb Pro subscription. Oh. So, you know, at least phone numbers and email addresses yeah. to a lot of these folks. And, and I, I actually could and should do more outreach um, than I'm doing. Um, but, you know, got lucky with a few. And, a, you know, a few just kind of came our way. A few people, like I saw Thomas Jane had his own production company. So I bypassed the publicist altogether. I just sent an email and said, Thomas, you might be interested in our show. And he said, that sounds like fun. So um, I grew up in a movie family. I knew a lot of people in the film business, but they're all dead now. <laughs> oh, no. So aside from someone like David Lynch, you know, whose foundation I work for, I just don't, I just don't know that many people anymore. But you, you were mentioning off camera that you grew up as a, a child actor. I, uh, my, my family, uh, we, we moved to Los Angeles from New York and when I was a kid, little kid. And my dad worked for Fox Studios, and he was a casting director for ad agency. He did uh, um, drama teaching. He was a 20th Century Fox Studios uh, drama teacher for new talent for some years. One of the productions on the Fox lot, they had, were doing a show, and they needed uh, like a 10-year-old kid to like see, say a couple lines. And he said, I know someone. <laughs> <laughs> So I went in and met with, uh, you know, whoever. And, you know, I called Red Cold or whatever. I did okay. And so, you know, so I think what happened was the, the light bulb went up, off over my mom and dad's head, right? And I thought, oh, okay, you know. <laughs> and I, w- I never felt exploited. It was always a lark. It was, there was never any pressure. Mm. But um, we got me, we got, we got myself an agent going on auditions for shows. And I wouldn't get four or five, but then I'd get one. And I'd start to build my credits. And it went like that from like age 10 to 15. Mm. And then it kind of ended. It was interesting that in those days, the studio rules were such that at age 16, they could work kids longer without a teacher on set, all these different advantages, mm. union rules that made it advantageous to hire an older kid to play a younger part. So to hire 17, 16, 17 year old kids to play a 14, 15 year old. So the work started drying up. And for me, it was not a career ambition thing. I just, you know, just, well, it's not working out now. But when it was going, it was going great. Had a, a, a three month run on a, in a stage production in Hollywood called The World of Ray Bradbury. He's no longer alive, but he was a famous, famous science fiction writer. Books like Fahrenheit 451, um, Something Wicked This Way Comes, The Martian Chronicles. And that was fun. I got to meet a lot of great people, famous people, who would, Hollywood people who would come backstage after the show and like movie legends that I got to meet, you know, 
And so, and, we, and plus, I got paid fifty bucks a night. That's six, yeah, six nights a week. Yeah, that's something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and I'm just remembering too. You were in the ending scene of one of my first short films, Off the Clock. Ah, do you remember that? It was. Was that with Andy? It was. With Andy? Yeah, I sort of. Remember. It was so funny too because I think, um, as most indie films go, and of course, I, I must have been 16 or 17 at the time. So I was just totally guessing the whole way through. But I just remember that I was sort of playing that line that you said, uh, sharks, squalls, some real life threatening shit. <laughs> and it's forgive very me, obscure. Forgive me, remember, remember. No, no, no. I remember though, I mean, I hadn't done anything in front of the camera on stage for, I mean, like, you know, 30 years. Yeah. And then Elaine Spear and John Spear, who did some theater work here in town years ago, you and Jane Lee had me do, asked me to do something, you know, for some little film she was making, Jeff Boothby. Some short film. It was fun. We were, we were always happy to help, you know. I mean, that, that's how I got the ball rolling and, and started right. learning. Good for you. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I want to dive right into some some favorite movie topic. Okay, let's hear it. Lay on me. <laughs> I don't know. I want to hear one of yours, several of yours. What, what are some of your favorites? So probably if I like thinking of my like favorite, favorite films, um, Lawrence of Arabia, mm. probably one of my. It's great. Yeah. That's like top three, four, maybe. And I've seen it dozens of times. First saw it in a, in a big movie palace in Hollywood when it came out in 1962. Wow. You know, with the program and the intermission and orchestral prelude and the whole thing. If you haven't seen Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's get to it. See it on a big screen. Yeah. Good sound. Yeah. It's long, you know, three and a half hours. It, it's meditative for me. It's, I'll sit down and the music is the just terrific. It's a whole yeah. package. Yeah. And it's interesting in a way. It is in a way like two different, two separate movies. The first half takes its time and unfolds. Yeah. Um, I had read that David Lean spent so much time on the desert scenes and building up in that first half leading up to where they, you know, Lawrence takes over the port city of Aqaba. Second half of the movie, it's got a different feel, actually. It's a whole different feel. It's the same story progressing, but it's a little bit different feel, and it it, it, it doesn't un unfold with the same kind of pace somehow. But the whole package is and remarkable performances. Mm. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's one. Yeah. You, you give me one now. Throw one out of me. Cas Favorite film. Casablanca. Uh -huh. Without a doubt. Can't lose. <laughs> I love it. What a beautiful movie. Yeah. I mean, Rick is just such a, a nuanced character. I, I really enjoyed him a lot. Uh, you know, a man of many principles and he doesn't want to do this or that. But then he starts, you know, throughout the course of the movie, he starts lightening up a little bit and he starts breaking some of his own rules. You discover through the course of the film that he is, a, he, you know, he suppressed his noble inclinations, mm. but they can't stay suppressed forever. Right. And a lot of it suppressed through the suffering of a heartbreak, mm. which, you know, he gets reminded of that heartbreak when the love of his life shows up unexpectedly. But what what a great movie and such a great supporting cast with Claude Rains mm -hmm. as Louis. Yeah. The uh, Vichy Inspector. Yeah. Um, Conrad Veidt mm -hmm. as von Strasser, <laughs> the Commandant, uh -huh. Peter Lorre. Yeah, and yeah. some of these names are just going right over my head. Sorry, I'm being no. too, <laughs> too arcane. I shouldn't do that. <laughs> no, Sorry that's all right. That. Hey, we got to shut okay. these people out. So Peter Lorre is Ogade mm. in the movie. Rick, 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 you must hide me, Rick. Yeah. Right? Right, okay. Uh, any, you know, he, famous actor from the 30s and 40s. And Maltese Falcon, if you ever seen Maltese Falcon. Mm. No, I haven't seen that Oh, one. it's a great one. Okay. You, you should see Maltese Falcon. Cool. Because uh, Bogart and then Sidney Greenstreet, who's a big stout actor, and uh, Peter Lorre are starring that. Uh, John Huston directed the movie. Beautiful. Yeah. I... Uh... <clears throat> on a on a side note, I, I took one of uh, Robert McKee. You know Robert McKee? I've heard of him. Okay, okay. He, he wrote the book Story, and, and he's just one of the foremost uh, authorities on screenwriting and, and story structure. And kind of in the vein of like Joseph Campbell, mm. um, but maybe just more mechanical as it pertains to screenwriting. Mm. But I took his workshop, and you know he's been doing the same workshop for. 40, 50 years mm. and people just go back. They're like a repeat. I've been here nine or 10 times. Wow. Um, 
but he always closes his workshop with Casablanca and then champagne toast at the end. Ah. And he says, movies don't get any better than this. Ah. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know much about screenwriting, but I, I mean, I know it's a, it's an art, of course, but it's also a science. Yeah. And there's a science around the structure. You know, and the, and the, and, and the parts and the, you know, the flow, right? You got your, your first beat, your beginning, your middle beat, you know, your, the crescendo, the whole, the whole thing. And, you know, the conflict and conflict resolution and all that that goes on. And, you know, there must have been, I imagine many screenwriters, you know, they follow a template, but they fill it in with their own, right? And so, yeah. And, and I, so I, I just, I know it when I see it, I know great writing. Yep. I know great writing when I hear it, when I see it, you know, in so many films with writing that's just, you know, The Godfather is, to me, Coppola and Puzo's screenplay mm-hmm. for The Godfather. Uh, Coppola's screenplay for Patton, I think, is yeah. incredible. Movies like, you know, Shawshank Redemption. Oh, that's great. You know, the Frank Darabont, mm-hmm. who adapted Stephen King's, you know, has he's done a couple of them. He's done, hasn't made a lot of movies. Uh, and they might all have been... Stephen King adaptations. The Mist, I don't know if you ever saw The I Mist. I saw The Mist, yeah. That was disturbing. Very almost. disturbing, but yeah. really powerful. He did The Green Mile. Mm. Yeah, those are some classics right there. Yeah, Darabont's really a great writer and a great, yeah, great. But then there's like, you know, so many. So, any, something you see more like uh, current? Uh, some that make the list over the last five, six, seven years, maybe, would be like um, Ex Machina. Oh, I really loved that oh, one. Oh, I loved it. I thought the writing was just... Oh, fantastic. Incredible. Yeah. And that was kind of the emergence, too, for uh, both of those actors, I feel like, were just starting to get to the top of their... Yeah, I think maybe the first time I saw Alicia Vikander yeah. and Oscar Isaac, I'm not sure I noticed before that either. And then I started seeing them everywhere. And so yeah. I don't know if they got a better agent or what. You know, they, they it could be down. a movie like that, a breakout role... It can really, yeah, it can just, it can, you know, it can make it for an actor. No question. You know, Oscar Isaac, like um, uh, Inside Blue and Davis, the, the Coen Brothers movie. You start in that. I don't think I saw that one. What? <laughs> well, all right. Tell me. Tell Are me you a Coen know. Brothers fan? Big Lebowski. Lebowski? Yeah. Fargo? I mean, who? Lebowski's like, yeah. Lebowski's a classic. Yeah. We actually did a uh, recorded an interview for the Famosters. We haven't used it yet. With a, a fellow named uh, Jeff Dowd, who was the inf- actually inspiration for the dude. Oh, oh wow! He was That's the, he knew the Coen Brothers, and he was the inspiration for Jeff Bridges' character. Yeah, Coen Brothers, Raising Arizona, Miller's Crossing. Um, of course. Uh, oh, brother, where art thou? Oh yeah, that was good. Well, actually, this is another question I have for you, which yeah, is right. like, do you have your different categories of of what you seek out in a movie? You know, like sometimes I'll have my sort of guilty pleasure movies, which are like shark attack movies. I'll watch um, anything if it's good. Yeah, I mean, I don't mind. I don't mind violent slasher. Yeah. Or I mean, there's some great horror movies, you know, that have come out in the last couple of years. Yeah, that's true. Hereditary was really. Oh my god, was, was, was that really, good? Really good. That had a, just a great tone. Um, the Witch by Robert Eggers. I don't know if you saw The Witch. I did, yeah. God, was, both of those are great. That was, Hereditary. It was really it, creepy. It was creepy. It was so good. It was oh really good. God. Yeah, yeah. I won't spoil anything, but at the end, you're just like, yeah. what? What is happening? It is, I had to go back a, and watch that one because it was... Uh, that was unexpected. So, I know, you know, I mean, I understand people, you know, who have to be very selective in their movie taste because they're affected. Mm. psychologically, emotionally, whatever. I don't know if it's because I'm too thick and, you know, unenlightened that this stuff just washes over me or I find a lot of the stuff amusing or I'm too detached to take it too much to heart. But if it's really well done, um, yeah, I love zombie movies. Oh, they're great. I'm a big zombie movie fan. <laughs> um, and I thought World War Z. Yeah, you know, it was a great excellent entry in the zombie collection. And I'm just like, oh man, Brad Pitt's in the zombie movie. Yeah. I, I'm there. I got to check it that out. That was great. That was prestige. Yeah. That was a prestige zombie movie. Not a Living Dead, you know, the original one, George yeah. Romero from 1968 or whatever. I remember renting the whole stack of them on VHS back when we had Movies America. Yeah. I love zombie movies. <laughs> I spent a sick weekend just yeah. watching them. I love zombie movies. <laughs> Documentaries. 
Yeah. There's so many greats. Like my co-host Bruce would say often on our show when we were doing KRU, he said, this is the golden age of documentaries. Mm. And it's true. You think they're remarkable. So many great, great documentaries. I've got some, you know, favorites of mine, King of Kong, mm. you know, about the video gaming world. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Um, Walter Day. Walter. Yeah. Yeah. Movies about the music world. Um, Standing in the Shadow of Motown, mm. uh, 20 Feet from Stardom, uh, Muscle Shoals, just great documentaries. And I love, I love the music world. I love that. It's, it's a way to get close to it and get a kind of inside look. Certainly like Netflix and YouTube have so dramatically changed the landscape for filmmaking in general. I, I would imagine anyone with a, you know, a script and a camera. Could get something made now because well, can certainly get it made whether or not it, it surfaces. I guess, but you know, yeah, it would. I would imagine the content scouts, yeah, for Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu and Disney Plus and Paramount Plus and you know HBO Max. But what a what a field day for for the viewer. I mean, I actually watch more now episodic, I don't even know what you call them, streaming shows yeah. than movies these days. Yeah, that's been true for me too. I, I only find a, a reason to get to the movie theater maybe a handful of times a year. If, if well, with COVID, I, I mean, I did a movie in two and a half years. Yeah. So I watch all my stuff on, you know, online. Yeah. Yeah, what, what are some of the episodic shows that you've liked, that you've seen that you've really liked? You know, I think it started first with a show like The Sopranos, and then um, I, I've i probably watched uh, all the way through multiple times. Breaking Bad? Oh, mm-hmm. yep. Breaking Bad, Mad Men. Oh. I had to stop halfway through Breaking Bad and then come back to it because it was getting a little too dark for me, but... Uh, still, just one of the best, and one of the best showdowns in the season finale, I think, of any TV or movie oh. that I've ever seen. Oh, you mean the last episode, the last show, the last episode? Yeah, yeah, just a great showdown there. It was great. Have you seen Better Call Saul? The oh, spin-off? yeah. I love that. It's fantastic. It's so funny. And the new the new season's out. I, I got yeah, to find the one. It's actually two parts. First seven episodes are out now on AMC. And I think the next installment comes uh, in July. Oh, that's um, something to look forward some to. Of Succession on HBO. Yeah. Characters who are just venal and backstabbing, and horrible, but so a lot of entertaining. In, a lot of intrigue there. Um, I, yeah, the first season it, it didn't hook me as much as because um, what are they on to now? Third season, I think. Of I think they just finished the third season. Yeah. Billionaire. It's called Billions. Billions. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah, Paul Giamatti and uh, Demi Lewis. Just. Yeah. Both terrific. No, I know it's great. I haven't seen it. I want <laughs> yeah. to see it. Peaky Blinders oh, yeah. is one I've That's, enjoyed. My new season is just out now. It's funny because like whenever they take a break, or sometimes they'll spend like two seasons creating the next season, and so I'll get lost. I'll forget where I am, and then I, you know, yeah, you kind of well, yeah, I gotta watch right. the recap, or sometimes I'll go back and watch the last episode of the last season just to kind of remind myself where we left off. Yeah, because a lot of times there is like a what one two year hiatus and you don't know like you know Ozark was another one Barry with Bill Hader on HBO. Oh, it's people keep saying I gotta see Barry. It's, and it's I black seen comedy. It. I like the black comedy ones. Yeah, it's really black comedy, but it's great. He's great, great cast, well done. Yeah, some of these shows Hacks with Gene Smart I enjoy. Mm. You'd think I don't do anything else but watch, <laughs> but it's my profession now. Yeah. So I have to. No, it's fantastic. So like, um, what was that process of getting David Lynch on your show and, and like, what kind of preparation did you do? Uh, so I helped with my colleague, Bob Roth and my wife, Julie, helped launch the David Lynch Foundation 16 years ago, 16 mm. after your Oh no, almost 17 years, wow. 17 years ago next month. Um, you know, I was a TM teacher for many years, became a TM teacher, but for many years I didn't teach. I was raising a family. I had jobs here in town. But then, you know, it was around then I just said, I want to kind of get back involved somehow, just as the foundation was starting up. I got to know David through that. You know, I call him friend and he's just a gem. He's, you know, amazing, amazing guy. We were talking one time about uh, Richard Beamer. Oh, of course. Richard Beamer from yep. West Side Story, yep. The Longest Day, The Diary Dan Frank was a... Big star in the early 60s and just kind of you yeah. know, left Hollywood to yeah. pursue his own career. Lives in Fairfield. And uh, Richard, I met Richard when he was a, like a teenager, 20 years old, when my dad was at Fox Studios. Okay. He'd come over to the house because he might have been an acting student of my dad's. 
Mm. So I knew him like really, really early on. And then David cast him in Twin Peaks. Is Ben Horn, the hospital hotel lawyer. Absolutely. And he was great in that. Yep. So I remember having a conversation about Ben Horn one time about, and Richard. But other than that, I talked about David about films and movie making. But it's all about the foundation work. But when I was starting the show, I sent a note to David. David, would you, you know, would you consider, you know, being a guest on the show? We just and it might have been the first show we recorded. So it was really seat of the pants. Yeah, yeah. And he declined it for he was, he's such a sweetheart, but he was he's so busy doing his own he's so busy doing his own work. He said, you know, is it okay if I take a rain check? And and so I guilt tripped him. <laughs> I sent back an, a, another note. I said, David, I understand you're so busy. I don't want to exploit our friendship. I just it just occurred to me that, you know, maybe when you were starting out in your career, someone opened a door for you. Mm. That's such a great way to put it. He got back to you. Right? <laughs> he said, you're right. When do you want to do this? So he was a real sport. Wow. And it was, he, was, he was great. And so I did get to ask him questions about his movies that I wanted to ask and about things in the films. And we, um, uh, at the end of the show, which, by the way, you could see on YouTube. Absolutely. The Famosphers uh, yeah. on YouTube. And subscribe, please. If you don't mind, hit the red Absolutely. button. Absolutely. We, we're getting close to the magic thousand subscriber mark. But you see David Lynch or John Heglin or Michael Imperioli, Thomas Jane, many others. Some great people. Really great, great guests. Robert Hayes, who was an airplane. And uh, at the end of the David episode, uh, we did a uh, uh, David Lynch trivia. Oh, nice. Where... Um, I gave him a line from one of his movies, and he had to tell me what movie it was from. <laughs> <laughs> and did it work? Did he? He did okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I was putting. I really put him on the spot. I said, "Oh, he was because he didn't know about this." I sprung it on him, right? Because mm-hmm. there was no re- pre rehearsal or we didn't prep anything like that. It was total, you know, off the cuff. But he, he he was a little worried. You know, I don't know if this is a good idea. I said, "Don't worry, don't worry." That. They're, they're really, I think they're really easy. He said, well, don't make them too easy because if I mess up, then it's really bad. <laughs> but I gave him a line from a movie and um, and then he, he he knew what movie it was from. But that was, that was kind of fun. That's great. Yeah. Well, what are your favorite David Lynch films? I love Blue Velvet. Some of them are, I just, I, David, in case you see this, don't, don't take offense. Um, Lost Highway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't just, think I sat through this all yeah, the way. Couldn't do it. Mulholland Drive, I love. Blue Velvet, mm-hmm. I love. Uh, Elephant Man was a beautiful film. Yeah. Eraserhead, I love. What was it? The, the story? The, the something story? Oh, Straight, straight, straight story? story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is a very unlynching film. Right. Right, that, that's based on the true story. This guy drove his little tractor across the state of Iowa to see his, his estranged brother. And that was a beautiful movie. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, it's beautifully done. But um, Lost Highway, I didn't really get. Inland Empire, no. Um, Dune, I love. Oh, it and it's great. David's, yeah. like, David's, it's a movie David and you like to talk about. Because he says, you know, he, he was deprived Final Cut That's by, right. by the De- 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 And it was taken away from him. So it doesn't really represent his artistic. But I, I, I see it, like, every time it's on TV, I'll tune in. And it's so retro because the effects are so primitive, right? It was before CGI. Right. 1984, 86, or whatever. So pre-CGI. But it was so ambitious. And the set design and the whole tone of it. I mean, speaking of Dune, I actually I actually like all the versions of Dune that have come out. Well, how many there have been? I mean, I saw that one, David's, and the There's one that David's just came one. out last year. Yeah. The Denis Villeneuve, one that just came out, which I thought was great, part one. Right, yeah. And then there was one other that came out, gosh, must have been 15 years ago, something like that. Really? There's a whole other series of Dune. Um, I'm, I couldn't tell you who made it, but it was good. Well, there's a great documentary about the, I think it's Argentinian filmmaker, Alejandro Jodorowsky, mm. who was going to make a production of Dune before David. And he had lined up, like he had like Salvador Dali and Mick Jagger and Orson Welles and all these amazing people lined up to be in it and the financing didn't come through, I guess, but only oh, had like HR Geiger who did the creature mm-hmm. effects for alien. You got a picture, a kind of a glimpse at 
what might have been. I don't remember the name of the documentary about Jodorowsky, but it's worth seeing. It's really good. Yeah. Cool. Anyway, so that's how I got David on the show. Yeah, that's And God bless him, he agreed. I know, that's fantastic. Gosh, it's like I learn something every time I have a guest on, obviously, but then also uh, the the performance aspect of this is a microphone, this is a camera, and I'm going to... You know, there's so many layers to it. Is uh, it's interesting. I have to confess, I get kind of oblivious to the whole. Well, then you're lucky because I just get wrapped up. I got the person on the computer screen, and just into it with them. Like our last guest was um, an actress named Corianka Kilcher. She starred in a movie called The New World, about Pocahontas and the first Jamestown settlers. And she tells this great story. She was 14 years old she, when she was cast in this movie, her first movie, to appear to be Pocahontas, opposite Christian Bale and Colin Farrell. I mean, two big, big stars. And, it's, and, and directed by a great director named Terrence Malick. And she just tells this beautiful story. And then she's also in the most, this, you know, hitch Paramount show, Yellowstone, with Kevin Costner. She's in. And she has a great part in that. And I just love just getting my getting to exercise my curiosity, right? Right. And ask the questions I want to ask as a movie fan. Yeah. And have them tell their stories. And ask you know, questions that I'm interested in. And my co-host Dean, same thing. He's he's great. He's he's just such a great conversationalist. I always have a ball. And we get to meet these really cool people. It, it's it's one of the um, the perks of the job, so to speak. Is my gosh, you get to be front and center on uh, what this person's career is or was. We and, just get and, to meet some neat people. I think the people have been responding well. They seem to like. They seem to enjoy the shows. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, for our listeners today, we'll put all the the links in the video description so they can check out your channel. Yeah. I think it's definitely worth checking out. Yeah, it's fun. It's you fun. get you get the heads up on uh, movies that are coming out and what what's hot and fresh. Some, some <laughs> yeah, some. We've done a few episodes where we'll talk about some of our recommendations yeah. too. You know, new movies and old movies. That's yeah. great. Have you seen Top Gun yet? No. Well, like I said, I haven't been to a theater in oh, two and a half years. That's right. I'm going to wait, but I've heard it's fantastic. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Either. Oh, but I, people are raving about the experience of, you know, the, the, the flight scenes. Well, as I understand, none of that was green screen. That no, was, no, yeah, no. Was, I mean, and, and Tom, Tom Cruise, Cruise, he's a madman. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, I have such admiration for the guy. You know, all his personal psychology <laughs> stuff aside and all that stuff. Right. You know, all the gossip and everything. Who cares? The guys, I just feel he's so committed to such a high degree of excellence mm. in the movies he he gets involved with, right? So, I mean, you know, like hanging from a cable on the side of an airplane when it's taken yeah, off. I I mean, come on, yeah. you know, climbing the side of the, of the, 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 the skyscraper in Dubai. <laughs> I mean, who does stuff like that? But he, you know, he wants to give it a reality. Of course, he's known for that. So right, right now, people go to the Tom Cruise movie and no, when he goes underwater and he holds his breath for eight minutes, he's really doing it. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Right? He's a real showman like that. And he's sure. like a real showman and really cares yeah. about, really cares to give the audience, you know, a real experience. So good for him. Yeah. I think. Good I think him. so too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, Chris, this was so much fun for having you on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me on. It's been a blast. Yeah, so good. Thanks so much for listening, you guys, and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>